Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for another beneficial and informative AERP Louisiana virtual educational program. I'm Gary Kaligas, and I'm the executive council member for AERP Louisiana, representing Northwest Louisiana. In addition, I'm not retired. Uh, for the past 21 years, I've been the publisher of a monthly magazine called The Best of Times. Uh, this is a boomer senior magazine in our area and also host a weekly one hour Saturday morning radio show called The Best of Times Radio Hour. So I'm your host today. And uh, we want to first of all, thank you for participating and joining us today, but also we want to thank our friends at Shreveport Regional Arts Council for partnering with AARP Louisiana to offer three virtual educational workshops dealing with culinary, painting, and now poetry. The last, uh, this is the last of the three workshops. And of course, this one concerns poetry. And we are pleased to have Ashley Mace Havard who is a poet laureate currently living in Caddo Parish, Louisiana. Many of Ashley's poems are set in rural Louisiana and speak to the relationship re relating to humanity, environment, and families. Good afternoon, Ashley, and thank you for sharing your love of poetry and sharing it with us today. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, well, I'm no longer the poet laureate for uh, Caddo Parish. The new one, I was I did hold that position for three years, um, but uh, the new one here is Poetic X, who is a spoken word poet. And so I'm really excited about that transition. Um, and Gary asked me to explain a little bit about what a poet laureate is or does. And uh, it can actually be whatever he or she wants it to be. Um, it's a position that um, is common in for a state, we have a state poet laureate, for instance, um, one new one, a Mona Lisa Saloy um, is our new state poet laureate. And, um, and then of course, in, in this parish, we're fortunate um, that the Shreveport Regional Arts Council and the Caddo um, uh, Parish Commissioners agreed to have that position for Caddo Parish. Um, and so what I did is um, just create as many opportunities for uh, people to learn about poetry, for um, local poets to be exposed to um, uh, well-known national poets by bringing them in uh, to a, a brand new residency um, that I was able to create with uh, the help of Shrek. And uh, we had readings, we had workshops, um, we had a, uh, uh, um, an all day long writing extravaganza where we wrote all over downtown Shreveport and then gave a reading uh, at the end of the day. Um, we did that twice. So it's an opportunity to um, uh, talk to school children, the elderly, whoever that you can find to approach and um, to, to, to have that opportunity for three years. And uh, it, was, it was really great. I, I, I loved it. Um, and I don't really know how long I'm supposed to talk, but <laughs> um, and anyway, about me, um, I've lived in Shreveport for over 30 years and I've been a poet forever. And um, I'm also a novelist. And I have uh, two chat books and two full length books of poetry and a novel uh, called Lightning Struck that um, appeared in 2016. And I'm, at present, I'm working on another novel. So that's taking up most of my time. Um, and thanks for coming. <laughs> well, thank you, Ashley. Everybody sit back and relax. We're gonna, we're gonna watch now a video presentation from our remarkable poet, Ashley, who's gonna guide you through the steps and the process of writing a poem. Then stay with us and we're gonna have a question and answer period where Ashley will answer your questions and give your suggestions and comments. So again, after this short video, uh, you will be able to ask her some interesting questions. So thank you again for joining us. Take it away, Jessica. Start the video. Welcome to the artist video series uh, sponsored by AARP Louisiana. I'm Ashley Mace Havard. I'm a poet and novelist, 
I'm going to be teaching a brief beginning lesson about mining memory uh, in the creation of poems. Uh, but first, um, I want to show you where I work. Uh, this is my tree house of an office uh, where I can be as close to the outside as possible without being eaten alive by, by mosquitoes or getting frostbite depending on the season. But I can, I can watch the light change and the trees change and the birds and the squirrels and everything I want to see. Um, it's, you may find that you need to be in a completely different place when you write, uh, say a coffee house or a bar, <laughs> I don't know, uh, a busy city street. But um, I, um, I'm aware that my creative energy uh, comes from nature. In a way, it's not surprising that this is where I like to write because I grew up on a tobacco farm um, in South Carolina in the early 1960s. And I know that the source of my creative energy comes from nature. I was my grandfather's constant companion from a very early age, uh, 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 walking the uh, tobacco fields and the pine timberland, checking the barns, feeding the cows, uh, baling the hay, uh, going to the country stores and to the feed and seed store, the barber shop. Uh, I was immersed in the landscape and in the culture as well. And since it was the early 1960s in the rural South, the civil rights movement was barely making a toehold. So my uh, past began in the totally segregated South and with all of that uh, conflict and uh, uh, change that was just beginning to happen. So it was just an immersive experience, um, both in landscape and in culture. The civil rights movement was trying to gain a toehold in the very reluctant uh, rural South. And so the richness of the environment and the tensions in the culture, um, I think I kind of was absorbed by that from a very early age. Um, the past was at war with the future and there was much to love and much to, to hate and always something to question. So, uh, just things in the office that, you know, make me feel, I don't know, inspired or comforted or, uh, just cause I like having them around are pictures from the farm over here and one of my favorite dogs. And then a faded picture of my parents over there. One, one uh, trade-off when you're in a, a windowy room is that everything gets faded, including the photographs. Oh, here, here, you know, things from the farm, like this cool things I would find. Arrowheads, points, uh, spearhead, I guess this is what this is. So little totems, uh, photographs that make me feel comfortable or uh, in some way make me feel like I'm doing something that maybe I shouldn't be doing. Um, there's a, I think with, with in, in any kind of creative act, there's a sense that you're doing something subversive um, that you shouldn't be doing because you're, uh, you're exercising your individuality and your own creativity and in a world where conformity is uh, what's more important, it's, um, I guess, you know, something that is um, a little bit subversive. Um, over here, uh, I have my books laid out. Um, I have books by friends. I have books that have inspired me. This is more the poetry side over here. Um, I'm working at present on a novel, uh, and the books that I um, that I keep rereading as research for that are over there. And then I have stacks and stacks of notebooks and notes all around 
the desk behind me uh, that um, uh, have either to do with the novel that I'm writing right now or uh, poems because I'm always writing poems just in note form and then throwing them aside because that's just what I do. I wouldn't advise that as a strategy because it's easy to lose things, but that's what I do um, because that makes me feel that I'm doing something I shouldn't do. And that's, I don't know, somehow inspiring. Um, I've been writing poems for 30 years. I began uh, my writing career as a short story writer, um, but about 30 years ago, that form just escaped from me. I had some early success with that, but then I found that I, after I wrote a story for a year, one story for one year, and then it was rejected everywhere I sent it, um, I thought, well, maybe I should try something else. So I, uh, one re nice rejection letter I got uh, suggested that I take out so much of the lyrical so many of the lyrical passages, which clogged the action of the story. So um, I decided to do that and make, uh, see if perhaps I could form it into a poem or two. And I did, and it worked. So uh, at that point, I began working in earnest on poetry, um, studying, reading, writing, um, becoming more educated in that genre. Uh, my husband, David Havard, is a really um, accomplished poet and has always written poetry. So in fact, we, I was living and breathing poetry anyway, living with him. So, uh, you know, I had that dialogue going constantly. Um, also, I, but I never stopped writing fiction either. And uh, so what I have are uh, two early chapbooks of poems, um, The Garden of the Fugitives, which came out in 20, 2013, 2014, and um, Wild Juice, which just appeared this month from LSU Press, and then my novel Lightning Struck, which is a historical book. Um, and at present, I'm writing a novel that takes place in the future. So. There we have it. Back here, there are journals where a lot of my poems have appeared, some of them. You're here because you're interested in writing poetry. Um, the first advice that I would give you is to read poetry. Here are just several anthologies that, that I'm really fond of. This one is absolutely terrific. I'm in it too, so I'm partial. Um, Hard Lines, Rough South Poetry. It really is an excellent uh, anthology of contemporary poetry. Um, this one is A Book of Luminous Things, an international anthology of poetry uh, edited by Czesław Miloš. And uh, if you really want Louisiana, this is the Southern Poetry Anthology, uh, volume, volume four, Louisiana. Online, uh, you can go to poets.org. Uh, for contemporary new poetry every day. So essentially, learning to write poems is not too different, I would imagine, from learning, beginning to learn about painting. Um, only we're using words instead of the physical colors and forms. Um, if I was interested in learning to paint, um, the first thing I would do is to go and look at paintings. Uh, what sort of painting am I most interested in? I would need to decide that. Uh, do I want to paint portraits, do landscapes, uh, miniatures, or murals? Um, what style of painting would attract me? Um, it would be essential to learn the basics, to learn about line and color and form. The basic ingredients, in other words, the basic techniques. Um, and it's the same with poetry. Only what we're using are words. Um, the world of poetry is a wide world. Uh, one needs to decide, um, are you interested in formal poetry? Sonnets, villanelles, uh, sestinas, um, or spoken word? 
the world of poetry is a wide world. Uh, it ranges from the highly formal, the sonnets and sestinas and villanelles, to spoken word and everything in between. Um, they rank, poems range in length from the smallest, the three line haiku or smaller, to book length epics. Um, they can be narrative, telling a story or lyric, um, which captures a moment in time. It can be a song, as in the Psalms of the Bible, um, or folk songs, ballads. Um, and although they're generally written in lines, they can also be written in paragraphs, as in prose poems. All that said, I can only talk about what I do, um, which I hope will, will interest you. Um, I might describe it, it doesn't really have a name, but I might describe it as traditional free verse as opposed to experimental. Um, my work pays attention to sound, to music, and an awareness of formal technique, although I do not conform to particular set forms. Uh, I use very little end rhyme, uh, but a great deal of internal rhyme. I try to capture the best word, the best image, the best detail for my purposes, uh, which brings us to purpose. What does poetry do? What is the purpose of poetry? Well, in a nutshell, it explores the questions and the problems of human experience. Um, it can be large or it can be small. Uh, not the exploring is not to arrive at answers or solutions to the problems, but to find and articulate meaning. Yes, stories and essays and memoir can do this too, but they involve um, fully realized scenes, character development, conflict, um, plot. They employ dialogue, summary, uh, and lots and lots and lots of pages. Uh, poetry, on the other hand, um, is more like a little gem. Uh, poems are more like little gems. Um, language is under pressure. And ironically, perhaps, um, the success or failure depends on how the poet uses the smallest sensory detail to bring the poem to life and to engage the reader, to ideally bring the reader into the experience of the poem, to knock down any boundaries between the poem and the person who reads the poem. Uh, again, in order to achieve this, it's essential to avoid the broad generalities and focus on the tiny, tiny specific sensory detail. Uh, in other words, it's, um, it's the language equivalent to macro photography. Uh, when you're employing macro photography, you're looking, you might be looking at a field of daisies. You know, it's kind of, I guess, not the greatest example, but you might be looking at a field of daisies. But to bring that field to life, you might focus on one daisy and to bring it further to life, the petal uh, of one daisy and to bring it even further to life, the grain of pollen on the petal of the daisy. Um, the thing is our experience, however individual, um, however particular, uh, is connected to all human experience. We're all in the same boat as artists, as poets. What we want to do in composing poems is to move others, to communicate, to make the reader say, oh yeah, I get that. I understand it. I'm, I'm not alone. I've, I've felt that myself. It might not be the identical thing, but it's something that the reader can connect with. And I can't say this often enough, it's the smallest concrete details that make this happen. 
um, I'm going to read in a few minutes some poems that I hope will illustrate this point um, and provide good examples for, for you all. Um, in one, a poem about a wrecked car, the anchoring image is the front windshield, uh, which is uh, protrudes and takes the form of, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, a poem about a wrecked car whose anchoring image is the front window that's swollen like a mosaic from a mosaic bowl from the impact of a child's head. In the other poem, uh, the sound of a wooden roller coaster, the clacking sound of a wooden roller coaster evokes an entire beach experience. One good thing about being an older writer is that we have so much, um, so much material to draw from, so many memories banked away. Uh, also, we have distance from that material. Um, we have perspective. One way to start is to explore a lingering memory. You know, think about it that way, a lingering memory one that's nagged at us for years maybe, lodged like a fish hook um, that the brain has never been able to shake. It has the weight of emotion attached to it. Maybe it's a place or a scene, that a place or a scene that you return to time and again in your memory. Um, maybe you don't know why, but you want to explore why. Why is that experience so important to me? Even after 20, 30, or 60 years, that memory uh, lingers. And remember, if it's important to you, it's going to be important to other people because it's part of the human experience. And if we craft the poem well enough, those outside of ourselves, those who read the poem, will relate. Uh, this lingering memory can involve, can involve a person, uh, say an eccentric aunt whom you both admired and who embarrassed you, uh, or a school bully. It can be an object like a piece of jewelry or a photograph, or the hook can be an event, um, often one that somehow in retrospect changed us, made us different than we were before maybe a death or a love affair or something really much smaller than those things. What these hooks, these tri triggering events, these people, things, places usually have in common are two major things. Uh, they involve intense sensory connections, uh, smell, color, texture. They appeal to the five senses. And they have an inherent tension, uh, emotional weight. We could use a funeral, for example. If we think of funerals and put ourselves back to just one, um, we're likely to smell the wilting carnations and the heat. Uh, we might notice the rich burgundy color of these heavy draperies that pool on the floor and collect dust. Um, the way your dress shoes pinch your feet. Uh, the sound of the rain drumming outside where you really would rather be. Uh, these things, these details are the things to trust, uh, to write down on paper, to list. Uh, these smallest details, um, always trust them to evoke the larger meaning. And that's the gold, that's the gold and the goal, G-O-A-L, uh, to go deep to the source of the tension. What I'd like to do is read a couple of poems from my book, Wild Juice, uh, to illustrate a little bit about what I was uh, talking about. Uh, these two poems, the first two poems I'm going to read stem from lingering memories of my own. And in reading them, um, I hope you'll listen for the concrete detail, the sensory detail that 
I hope brings the poet, the poem to life for you and uh, it will be useful to you as beginning poets. Uh, the poem Wreck uh, is one of the poems in the book uh, that's set on the farm of my childhood. And uh, the poem Wreck is one of the poems in this collection that uh, is set on the farm of my childhood. Wreck. That's when Mama put her foot down. My brothers and I would never again ride with Granddad if he was behind the wheel. Can you believe they let him keep his license? He knew somebody, had to be. It was a miracle, or so Mama said, that we survived. I remember nothing. Only the mangled, dusty, blue Ford in the junkyard stays with me. The shape of my forehead, a mosaic bowl bulging from the windshield. After years of surrendering her babies in sun or miserable rain to this cigar-chewing farmer to check barns, feed cows, walk timber, collect ticks, knowing we'd get stuck in some pasture, then soaked, then sick. After the nightmare sight of her children jouncing home atop the cab of his pickup, feet dangling over bug splatted glass, at last she would keep us safe. The old fool would go alone now, wherever he had to go. So I think you can understand why that would be a lingering memory that I might want to explore and work through a bit in the form of the poem. The next poem I'm going to read comes with uh, an illustration uh, of a postcard that is of the motel in Myrtle Beach that my grandmother managed in the mid-1960s. Um, and that motel is in this poem, the Ben Silay. Um, Another thing about the poem, it, which takes place in Myrtle Beach, uh, is that uh, the Vietnam War was, of course, going on, and there's, is, isn't, there was an Air Force base there, and um, soldiers on leave would you know, ride up and down the boulevard. This is called Beach Music, and it actually, uh, I think, appeals to all five of the senses including taste. Beach Music, Myrtle Beach, 1966. Clear from the shell pink stucco with turquoise trim motel she managed to the pavilion amusement park, my grandmother held my hand. Convertibles blared down the boulevard under the boardwalk what kind of fool? Ain't too proud to beg. Thirteen, I flashed V's for peace at soldiers on leave. My two long legs itched to run. The air was charged with Krispy Kreme, Copper Tone, Footlongs, Sea Spray. She squeezed my hand till it hurt at the saltwater taffy machine whose metal arms worked pastel ribbons, its window framed with colored lights reflecting her face lit up like a child's. Stay just a little bit longer. We were so close to the rides, I could hear the clack, clack, clack of the roller coaster teasing up its wooden scaffold. Release so close, the screaming plunge. Okay. Sometimes there's a surprise. Um, something happens in the present that triggers a memory from the past. And I will fall back on the fishing metaphor again. Um, it's good if you're a writer or any artist, I would think, to be in the habit of casting. Uh, 
always casting, keeping your mind open and hoping that something will just kind of come to you. And sometimes something, usually a sensory detail, will catch that fish. Um, the memory that maybe you weren't even aware that you had that's swimming at the bottom of the ocean of your whole memory. Um, swimming at the bottom of the sea of your memory. Uh, again, the poem would be generated. Again, the poem is generated by the exploration to discover why, what makes it important. I'm gonna read two poems that derive from that surprise. Uh, when something from the present hooks something else specific from the past and reels it in. The poem Gone to Wild uh, began in my mind one early spring when I was uh, walking the dog down the sidewalk and a new vine, a new tendril, kind of reached out and smoothed, kind of reached out and touched my arm. Um, and it brought back, for some reason, memories of old women that I knew when I was a little girl. Um, and all the pr profusion of spring color, the way it does in Louisiana, uh, in March usually just explodes, reminded me specifically of old women um, in family, at family reunions when they would dress up and expect you to kiss them and hug them and they would remember your name, although you might not have any idea who they were. Uh, and this poem also takes the convention of spring um, connected with youth and twists it. In this poem, uh, spring is bought, brought to you by old women. Gone to Wild. Not like young folk, manic kids or feverish teenagers, but old women, those I knew back when I wasn't one. Great Aunt Millie, the pretty sister my grandmother sniffed. Sly eyed, secrets pushing to sprout from her tight lipped smile, her cheek to my kiss, a pollen dusted rose. Or my best friend's thin, too friendly Aunt Irene, teeth stained red. Her lipstick wandered, whose fingertips, new growth tendrils of jasmine, grazed our arms if we got too close. Or the ones whose names I'd long forgotten, cousins, twice, thrice, who knows how many times removed, who never missed reunions at Antioch Baptist Church, dressed to the nines in sky blue peach, mint green lilac, hair spun and sprayed into fine and fluffy clouds. They won all the door prizes. Oldest descendant, traveled farthest, perfect attendance. Chatting among themselves, notes rising, falling, depending on whether or not they wanted you to hear. Tearing up generously, equally, at drooling babies and toppled headstones in the gone to wild graveyard. I picture them rooted, both garden and gardeners, pruning, feeding, clawing up weeds in a fury. Their perfume reeled me in. Arms strong from the hoe, how else to explain such force? squeezed me to stock stiff corset or peony cushioned bosom. They weren't about to let go. <clears throat> and uh, finally, uh, the last poem I'm gonna read um, is uh, features uh, both the triggering event from the present 
and the memory all in one poem um, and in as I read this uh, think maybe about how the smells in particular function uh, in this poem uh, there also are illustrations for this one uh, the dog and the daughter that are referred to in the poem proof the black dog settles his chin on the edge of the bed works it onto my pillow he inches his nose tip to mine and breathes humid day into my night breath canned sardines and damp saltines fumed out of dreaming i squint into his grave brown stare he needs to know that i will rise my hand finds his wide head a long soft ear satisfied he curls onto the floor begins at once to snore in this dim half waking my spirit remembers fear and cannot keep from returning to the one child i was not unable to bring into the world my face lowers until there her milkish breath, the rise and fall of thin cotton, her rare small chest. Holidays she returns, as if a ghost, I crack open her bedroom door. Dark hair frames a woman's face, but her mouth is her newborn mouth. If she opens her eyes, she will laugh, then she will leave. If you want to take a chance on my collections, uh, Wild Juice and The Garden of the Fugitives, um, other poems that, um, that are specifically uh, reliant on uh, lingering memory or triggered memory, uh, in Wild Juice, the poems Late for Reading or Soldier Boy, and in Garden of the Fugitives, uh, Persephone's Crown, and Queen for a Day. Uh, although both collections are filled with poems that rely on memory. This poem is from The Garden of the Fugitives, so my uh, previous full collection, um, which came out in 2014 from Texas Review Press. Uh, this poem in came from one of those lingering memories. Uh, it's about a Little Miss Beauty pageant. And uh, yes, which I was in. And uh, there maybe, I don't know, maybe one reason that I kept thinking about writing this poem is that I still have the crown that came from this pageant and it was not a real crown. It was cardboard covered with aluminum foil of all things. And I remember being so incredibly disappointed that I didn't get a, like a real rhinestone crown. Um, anyway, uh, it's a complicated poem. Um, I was miserable uh, the whole time. Persephone's Crown. It's for a good cause, they say, which is enough for me at seven, a tomboy aiming for the missionary life, to endure the pink yank of curlers, caged thorns of crinoline, white gloves, ankle socks, martyrdom, for the J.C.'s seasonal pageant in the Rains High School Gymnasium. The air is stale from last night's game, the stage gritty beneath mirror slick Mary Janes that blister. The grown ups have sacrificed my Saturday to this spotlit night. My school friends, too public in their mother's lipstick, are hollow eyed as the dead 
big bowed girls in our grandmother's musty albums. I trust that I am feeding starving children. Teeth set, back straight for them. I remember what the others forget to curtsy at the edge of the stage where white hot footlights put out our eyes. I pray to be passed over, not me, Lord, but I am plucked, the adorable one, littlest Christmas angel. All eyes follow as a sweating man takes my cotton hand and draws me center stage for a kiss and a $20 savings bond. Polite applause. I freeze. Smile, he whispers. Come on, sweetheart, smile. He shoves the crown down, killing my curls. Tin foil crinkled over cardboard. It scratches like thorns and stays put. And I will leave you with an exercise to play with until we meet again. Um, and here it is. This is for you. Uh, think back to your childhood or youth uh, or at least 10 to 20 years ago. Find the something, the someone that you can't let go. Think of the space where a tooth was, how the tongue always goes there. It's that memory. It may be connected to a place. A kitchen is generally a place where uh, emotions run strong. A person, uh, maybe somebody you'd like to forget but you can't. An event such as a first death or an object like a photograph, a toy, or piece of jewelry. Whatever it is, it should be a thing that evokes complex emotion, a combination of fear and anger, anger and confusion, confusion and misery, misery and joy. A moment in time after which you were different in some way. Uh, it must matter to you in order to matter to the reader. I would suggest just try free association, free writing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, just let go and list or compose from, mem from your memory as many concrete sensory details as possible. And then let it rest. If you want to, return to it. Let your mind boil around a little, rest, think some more. Maybe you think of more details. And keep playing. If you're reading other poems, uh, learn from the poets that you're reading. Uh, notice what they're doing to bring you in. What, what strategies, what craft they're using. And always remember all of the five senses, smell, feel, hear, taste, touch, see. Thanks for tuning in. I look forward to chatting with you virtually in person soon. Thank you, Ashley. Wow, that was very good. Very good. I hope our uh, viewers here really enjoyed it. I did. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on your exercise. It made me think about something that I'm going to try to do something in poetry. Uh, 61 years ago, I had my first piano recital at 10 years old. And I was in a large group of students. Uh, though I was not the youngest, I was the most. I'd only taken piano for three months. And my music teacher said, you have to be part of this recital with all of the 75 people. And I was extremely nervous. And I memorized this piece over and over again. And then when I came up, it was this large Steinway piano, which I have never practiced on. And I, when I saw it, I was like intense. I almost was in tears at a 10 year old little boy. But some of the other younger people are going to come after me. And I, I was like, I was tense and nervous. 
But I went up there and it was, you could hear a pin drop. I remember looking at my parents and relatives in the audience. And I remember seeing my teacher giving me a great smile. But I remember all the other fellow students out there. I didn't know all, hardly any of them. And, uh, but the touching thing was I completed the piece. I didn't mess up. And I had a round of applause and a standing ovation. I can cry right now about it because they all came on stage and, and hugged me. And I mean, it was touchy that, and so, so 12, 11 years, I mean, seven years later, I'm not the number one child on the, on the piano. I'm the last person to play because I'm now an astute pianist. And I did the same thing for a young person on that given day. So cool. Oh yeah. Piano recitals. That is a great place to go in your mind because yeah. Many of you were talking about it. I was going back there too. Um, I had to take, my mother was a piano teacher. So I was forced to take piano. And um, it, first with her until she gave up and then she sent me to somebody else. But um, yeah, piano recital, those are intense times. That's a great story. I love your story. I'm glad I had a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other other question, I'm, you know me, I like to ask a lot of questions. I see a lot of, instead of people writing their memoirs about events and about things like the piano recital and, and uh, their achievement of, uh, of climbing, climbing Mount Everest or going to the Eiffel Tower, I can see now relating this in, in poetry and in verse rather than writing a, you know, a short story about it. This is this is your reflection of what happened that particular event that particular episode is that correct you're asking me yeah oh okay yeah. yes yes exactly um um so I, I noticed that in some of in the chat someone wanted to know um the difference between writing using these memories in poetry and using them in prose how do you decide what's more appropriate for this form or what works better for that form and honestly, there's no good answer. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of a lot of writers will tell you that who write poetry and stories will tell you that poems, or that stories uh, eat up the poems, or that poems eat up the stories. You just kind of have to choose one thing or the other. And I, you know, unless you have the characters. I guess one big difference is if you've got characters in conflict, um, that somehow your memory involves more than just a moment um, that you want to just get down. That that's that's when it's right for a poem. It's okay. like a crystal. It's it's a snapshot. It's it's a meaningful moment that I don't know. The form just calls for that. But if you've got if you've really got characters in conflict and you want to explore that or a beginning, a moving, 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 moving up and down this plot um, that you've got going in your mind, well, you know, you might want to think about working with a story or a novel form for that. Um, I do both. And it's still hard for me to describe why one thing is right for this and one thing is wrong for that, right for that. Um, yeah, they inter they overlap. Did I kind of answer your question or did I go off on a tangent? No, that was good. That was understandable. <laughs> uh, we have several um, people out there who want to ask you some questions. Um, so the <laughs> other one is, and I think this is a great question. It's from Miss Falvey. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, um, but she wants to know if you've taken drama classes because you recite your poetry so expressively. Oh, um, thank you. Or, yeah, she says, or does it come naturally? from the connection between you and your mind and your heart and the writing? Um, I, I didn't really take drama classes, but I was in plays along and along. Um, my daughter is was a theater major, and so she's been very critical of my reading. She would probably hear this video and think, oh gosh, why didn't you ask my opinion um, or ask me to tutor you? But it's a combination of both. I practice and also I do every time I read the poems, I do get involved with the poem. I, I interact with the poem emotionally. Um, I see the images again and I experience the poem again. 
So uh, yeah, it's like, I guess it's all those things. How did you get the title of Wild Juice? How did you get the title of your collection of poetry, especially this one about Wild Juice? What did that denote? Um, that, uh, my editor actually found that title because I was having a whole lot of trouble finding the right title for this last collection. And it, let me grab the book just quickly. Um, it, it's, uh, it's from a line in, in a poem in the book. Um, and it's, uh, well, you now which one is it? Anyway, it's there, <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the book. Um, so the, that particular image of wild juice, it, it, although the book um, explores change um, and uh, it circles out from my father's death, um, my own aging, climate change, um, there's a current of hope that runs through the through through the poems, um, and it's a positive. Uh, there's humor, and although it there's you know yes there's death yes there's aging yes there's the climate crisis but still there's this human spirit running through through the collection, and so I thought that was a good idea just to focus on something that had a, a kind of a, a positive feel. It does. Uh, David Atwood asks, sometimes I feel like I've already mined from the same idea so many times that I've just written the same poem over and over. How can I shake up my idea starters? Hmm. Same thing over and over. Gosh, David, I need to see. I'm not, I'd, I'd like to know an example, um, really. Um, uh traveling is one good way to do it um or maybe if you're if you're an an experienced writer and you're used to writing a particular way in, in other words starting at a particular point and this is how you're used to writing a poem uh turn it around do something completely different um instead of if you're if you're in the habit of just like starting out and free writing maybe that's not the right thing for you at this point, um, imitate. Uh, find a poem that you really admire or a poet that you really like and read and read that particular poet and imit imitate the poem and see what happens there. Um, uh, just to loosen it up, loosen something up. Um, uh, you know, I used to, to, when I was teaching fiction writing, um, I like to do the what if, uh, trying to, um, you know, what if this happens? What if play that game? What if this happens? What if that happens? Uh, you can do the same thing with poetry. What if I try, what if I try this? What if I try that? The good thing about poetry is it's just not like um, brain surgery. Um, there's no one thing you have to do. Uh, you're not going to kill anybody. You're not even going to kill your poem. Um, you can always change it. You can always make it better. Um, you can always do it differently. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Do editors come back and critique on saying you shouldn't have said this, you shouldn't have used this term, or you should expand upon this? How critique are they when they're when you submit poetry to them for publishing? Um, it depends on the editor. Um, some edit book editors will take the manuscript as is, and they're not very particularly hands-on. They'll either accept it or reject it. Um, uh, Dave Smith, who edited the Wild Juice collection, was very hands-on, um, very, very involved. And I spent a whole summer pretty much going, or it seemed like a whole summer, um, it wasn't quite that long, going back and forth with him. Um, there were just a handful of poems that he had problems with and just either working with those poems to, to so that he felt comfortable with them um, or and or else just cutting cutting it out of the collection altogether. So I did both. I, I cut one or two poems that I just couldn't defend. Um, and then the rest I was able to to work with him uh, until we agreed that this was a better a better draft and one of our the book, the book is much stronger as a result 
Ashley, one of our, our viewers here asked, can you, Edgar, Sarah asked, could you share your thoughts on what constitute a prose poem and how it differs from other styles of, of poems? <laughs> oh, there are lots dear. of different styles of poems. I mean, you mentioned <laughs> traditional free verse. I'm sure there's a rhyming poem. I remember mm -hmm. doing a lot yeah. of the rhymes. Yeah, there are what? forms and the formal poems, the free verse, and the prose poem. The prose poem, um, I have one prose poem in the in this collection. Um, and it's you just like and we were having this discussion earlier. Um, um there are so many different ways of uh the house of poetry has many rooms um there's the formal there's the free verse there's spoken word um and the prose poem you're just moving a little bit more toward fiction um you're not quite all the way there you're not all the way to flash fiction because you got the same problem with fiction or not problem but you've got the same different variety of forms and short stories you've got little short short stories flash fiction short you know, and it can grow um, till you get to a novella size. And it's just all kind of a continuum. So think, I think of prose poems as just a little bit more toward fiction um, so that there's no reason to divide the lines. Um, and every poem makes it want, want something different. Um, so you let the poem eventually when it's to a, a more finished form, it kind of tells you what it wants to do. And in my case, it just wanted to be in these little paragraphs and numbered paragraphs. And I didn't force it into lines. I probably did try it in lines because I try a lot of things before I finally settle on the final thing. Um, but it just was right the way it was. And so that's kind of between you and the poem. Uh, you have this dialogue in a way with your with your work and say, is this is this right? Is this really right? And and says, yes, I think so. So um, that's about as good as I can do. <laughs> well, that's great. Anybody else have any questions? Feel free to ask us or put it on the chat room. If not, we thank you, Ashley, for sharing your information on how to write a poem and a lot of different aspects of them. I learned a lot of new things. I'm not a, a great person of writing poetry and uh, reading poetry, but uh, this is an entering genre that I think more and more people are getting into. And as we talked earlier, I mean, I think poems are a form of lyrics for songs. I mean, every song I'm writing, if you just, if you just read out the lyrics, most of them to me are like poems. Absolutely. And, um, you know, really, I, I left everybody with an exercise. And if you'd like to get back to me um, with, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, stay in touch. Um, AshleyMaceHabbard.com. Uh, you can reach me there. So I enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we're going to be uh, sending you out an information, a, a survey. And so uh, please do fill that out to help us have more um, of these type seminars in the very near future. Again, thank you everyone for participating and thank you, Ashley, again, and thank you our friends at Shreveport Regional Arts Council for partnering with us on these three fantastic virtual workshops on culinary, painting, and now poetry. Have a good day, everyone.